so uh, what I'm going to talk about is the use of cell factories. And just very briefly to remind ourselves what cell factories are. We've used them for uh, many thousands of years for production of very nice products like bread, beer and wine. But uh, also, of course, many pharmaceuticals are used today or produced today using cell factories uh, and also fuels and chemicals. Uh, citric acid, for example, is produced close to 1 million tons a year uh, going into soft drinks like Coca-Cola. If we look at the chemical market, uh, that's about a 3,000 uh, billion uh, US dollar industry, whereas the, the market for renewable chemicals is, is only about 1% uh, of this. Uh, but it, it's growing uh, much faster than the general chemical industry and expected to account for maybe up to 20 uh, US billion in 2020. If we look at the biopharmaceuticals, uh, this is a very large industry. We already heard a little bit about this before. Uh, and there is a very large uh, growth uh, rate in this market here. It's uh, estimated to be about 200 billion US dollars. Let me just first uh, quickly take a little bit about the recombinant proteins. Uh, so here's seen an overview about uh, some of the big uh, blockbuster products here. Uh, you see here uh, quite rapid growth in many of them. Uh, their sales in US billions, they're really driven very much by monoclonal antibodies, uh, hormones and growth factors. The cell factories used for production of these recombinant proteins is mainly Cho cell lines. This is dominated by that, but also uh, yeast, baker's yeast, and also E. coli, uh, but also some other different types of mammalian cells are used for this. By far the largest product volume-wise is uh, insulin and insulin analogs. This is dominated by a few key players, as illustrated here. And no one noticed uh, the largest producer is using yeast as a cell factory for their production of their insulin analogs. This was a major shift, actually, uh, compared with the Eli Lilly process, which is based on E. coli, which is somewhat more uh, complicated, particularly in terms of the uh, purification process. We have been working also on uh, looking into recombinant protein production using yeast. We used an insulin, uh, insulin precursor, actually, as a model for that. Uh, we did some collaboration uh, with Matthias Ulen uh, on using microfluidic screening for identifying uh, strains that have better secretion capacity. And then we did uh, sequencing of these strains in order to find new targets. And this has actually also allowed us to learn a lot of new biology about a pretty complex uh, pathway, namely the protein secretory pathway. And we are proceeding with this in future research where we're going to, again, go through many of these targets, but also combine continuously these high throughput technologies for screening, as well as also getting better strains for production of different, different proteins. For the rest of my talk, I'll talk about uh, a, a different types of products coming out of cell factories, uh, namely chemicals and fuels. Uh, this is, of course, uh, with the objective of creating a sustainable society where we need to have uh, production of our materials and our chemicals and our fuels uh, from uh, sun, uh, either through photovoltaic or through absorption uh, of energy into plant biomass. The plant biomass can be refined into sugars that we can then use for production of this. And this can, of course, be plugged into the general grid of where we're also using other types of electricity uh, for support in, in society. Uh, if we look a little bit on the energy consumption and supply, uh, the current global energy consumption is estimated to about 550 exojoule. Exo is 10 to the 18th. About 80 to 90 percent of this is from fossil uh, fuels, uh, distributed as illustrated here. Oil, about a third. Uh, coal, another about a third. Uh, natural gas, a little bit smaller. And interesting, you can see uh, bio is, is, is not even on this bar. It's a very, very small fraction today. Uh, this is expected to grow to about 860 exajoules. Uh, there will be a, a rapid increase in demand in many countries, China and India in particular, but there will be energy savings in many other countries due to more efficient uh, utilization in, in, in power usage in, in houses and industries and so on. But this is still one problem about supply. Uh, come a little bit back to that. Uh, we also, of course, have another uh, problem that is probably even bigger, and that is the greenhouse gas emission problem. Uh, many people don't believe in this. Uh, well, they, they maybe can see the numbers here, but they maybe don't believe that it has an impact on, on global warming. This is absolutely undisputable that it has an impact, and the consequences of that is maybe also something we can discuss later. So we have to solve these two big problems, supply as well as greenhouse gas emission problem. 
If you look a little bit on the oil use today, when you have a barrel of oil, uh, you are fractionating this. A little bit less than half is going for gasoline. This is a typical use of it. Some of it is going uh, for jet fuels, uh, diesel, and so on. And uh, some others are going into different into the chemical industry. About 10 to 15 percent of oil use today is, is used for production of chemicals that we use for all kinds of materials. But still, 80, 85 percent approximately is simply used for only for transportation fuel. Now, this landscape is, of course, changing because we are blending in more and more bioethanol into here. Uh, we are beginning to have more electric cars. So, so that means that, that this fraction here of the oil barrel is, is reduced use. And, and there is not a free exchange of, of the different fractions in this barrel here. So this will impact what, what is happening up here. So we will simply skew this balance. And so uh, this is already seen actually in Sweden that have many more diesel cars uh, compared with in Denmark. And so diesel cost, the diesel price is, is significantly higher in Sweden compared with Denmark. So this is really driving uh, many mo much due to these differences here. So we also need to have ways of producing biodiesel just like we're producing bioethanol here. A little bit about oil supply. This was a very interesting uh, commentary in Nature in, in 2012, where they did an analysis of the elasticity, price elasticity in terms of oil production. So these are, are real data that they have plotted over historical times, where you have the, the crude oil production in millions of barrels per day, and here you have the oil price, and they really see a change in elasticity when you hit this around 70, 73 million US dollars per barrels per, per day. And what happened when the recent years when the oil price went down uh, from about 100 to 120 US dollars per barrel to today of about 50 was actually that crude oil production was reduced. And much of that came around because of shale gas production in the US. And so it's very consistent this year. And so this also shows that if we're going to increase the demand for oil, the price is going to go up despite the fact that everyone is failing generally to predict about the oil price in the future, uh, these data are very, very uh, difficult to, to oversee. So how are we going to make uh, advanced biofuels? Uh, so this is this prospect of biorefining, where we take biomass and we produce all the different components that we need in our energy sector, uh, both for jets, uh, heavy trucks and so on, but also for gasoline cars. So there are basically two routes for this. When we have the biomass, you can do a simply thermochemical uh, conversion to what is often called a syngas platform. That uh, is basically the process based on fissure troughs. The South Africans used that when there was an embargo on import of oil to the country uh, during the apartheid regime. And so they took coal and basically processed in the same way as you can process biomass here. That is a very energy intensive route. Uh, there are some recent developments that, that it is actually possible to do the syngas route with, on smaller scale plants, but often you need very large scale plants, which means that you need a lot of biomass, and that can bring into a problem of actually having sufficient provision of that biomass, because you need to collect the biomass from a very large land mass. So therefore, there's a primarily focus on the, what, what is called the sugar platform. You take the biomass, you degrade it into sugars, and you use that for production then of fuels and chemicals. And the way you do that is that you, you get your sugars from the pretreatment of the biomass. Uh, you then have a cell factory that converts these sugars into your fuels and chemicals here. And the key enabling technology here is that we should in engineer this cell factory such that it can take these sugars and produce whatever we would like to need or have out here. And that enabling technology is what we refer to as metabolic engineering, where we change the metabolic landscape of that organism such that we can have a new catalyst that can do this transformation. Uh, this is already done, as I mentioned in the first slide. Uh, so, but if we look at the uh, current ethanol production, uh, that in, and this is from the US, this is increasing, it's about 75 billion liters today. It's mainly produced from corn in the US and sugarcane in Brazil. These are the two main producers. There are some production in Europe, but it's small compared with this. 
And uh, today, biofuels, and that's mainly bioethanol, account for about a little bit less than 10% of fuel consumption. And still, 40% of corn use in the U.S. is used for bioethanol. So these numbers, it's pretty obvious that, that we cannot we cannot get to 100% in this way. There is also, of course, some discussions about this corn use here. This uh, corn can also be used for food. Um, that is a little bit less of an issue in the U.S. because most of the corn in the U.S. is used for uh, cattle feed. And actually, you can take the yeast uh, residue from bioethanol plant, and that serves as an equally well protein source for the cattle than the corn. If we look at biodiesel production, uh, that is uh, today produced from uh, feedstock where you take plant oils, primarily from rapeseed or uh, soy oil. Uh, palm oil is also used to some extent, has been growing actually quite, quite a lot. Uh, palm oil is problematic because palm can only be grown in very small regions of the world. Palm oil is the one that is the cheapest. Uh, to produce those, so there's much interest in that. But if we take the European process, where most of the biofuel is actually produced in Europe, uh, that is primarily rapeseed oil. You take that oil, uh, you mix it, uh, you do a transesterification with an alcohol module. There you typically use methanol, and then you cre create what is called fatty acyl methyl esters, FAMES, that are then blended in directly to the diesel. Now, this process, as I said, is primarily an EU process. Actually, it's primarily a German process. It's pretty lousy, actually. Uh, it's heavily subsidized. And if you look at land use, this process, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, we could use that land much more efficiently to produce wheat, for example, where the energy content per acre is much, much higher. And we could use that wheat for production of, for example, bioethanol or any other product as such. Uh, this process here exists for various historical reasons. And actually, also, the EU requirement for biodiesel matches the spec of the fatty acid composition of soy oil uh, sorry, rapeseed oil so closely that it would actually be difficult to bring another biodiesel on the market. But that's, a, that's another thing we can discuss. So we have looked a little bit into, uh, based on kind of overall process uh, simulations, what are the production costs of different, uh, different fuels. And here, of course, we immediately start to see the challenge. So uh, here are for, for different... Uh, uh, for example, here is biocurrent biodiesel, here's corn ethanol, sugarcane ethanol is the cheapest, as you can see, uh, lignocellulotic ethanol, that's from biomass, uh, sugar to biodiesel, there is some, some error bars here, there are a number of assumptions that go into these calculations, but all of them, you can see conventional oil is very hard to beat. This is one of the fundamental problems there is with this, we can do it, but cost-wise, it's simply hard to compete with oil that you just pump out of the ground. If you look at the net CO2 footprint, uh, hydro, nuclear, and wind is, of course, very, very good. Solar uh, is very good. Uh, but here you can see an interesting thing also. If you compare with corn ethanol, it's actually not, not that good in redu reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Whereas if we could, could take some of that sugar and convert to biodiesel or to diesel, as I'll talk about at the end, then that would actually give a, a, a net CO2 footprint reduction compared with current ethanol production. So what are the projections for the future? Uh, it's been mentioned that that's very hard to predict. But still, uh, Steve Chu, the former chair of DOE, uh, Department of Energy, asked to uh, the National Petroleum Council to, to look into what is the supply security and minimize CO2 emission, but it should be cost not neutral. What should then be the energy distribution mix in the future? There is, of course, huge error margin, but you can see that clearly they did come up with biofuels as, as one of the contributors to this. Electricity and hydrogen also, of course, that's already happening, but biofuels is, is going to be a contributor to this. That's also uh, based on other predictions uh, where uh, in, in 2050 uh, there will be a major contribution here. And you can see there we will have for biojets. Um, and, and actually what will happen is that most of the corn ethanol is likely to be phased out and be replaced by other types of products. So we're basically facing a situation where we have the first generation of biofuels, it's bioethanol, is likely going to be phased out. Second generation is based on biomass conversion to that, so not use of corn, but all the residues. And here there are a lot of landmass actually in the world that can be used for this. Uh, in, the, in the southern part of the US that used to grow a lot of tobacco and, and, and uh, cotton, that is basically uh, empty land today that could be taken into use for production, dedicated 
production of biomass and then used for production of bioethanol. Or later on, also more advanced biofuels that can go into, for example, jets and so on. So it's already happening this with uh, jet fuels. There are a number of advantages. I'll come back and talk a little bit about this. Uh, so United has made a contract uh, to buy uh, 50, 57 million liters of renewable fuel. It's small. Uh, it's a very small fraction of how much fuel they buy every year. Uh, but uh, their suppliers is Neste, a Finnish company, and Aldea Fuels. And they're using animal fat or plant oils, uh, and particularly non-edible plant oils, uh, and cooking oil uh, to produce linear and branched uh, paraffins. Another development is that Givo, a biotech company in Colorado, is producing isobutylene uh, by dehydrogenation of isobutanol. This is produced by fermentation of an engineered yeast. And this can then be oligomized to branched hydrocarbons. And this, uh, this, is, this biofuel has also been tested by Alaska Air. Uh, there's also been work on actually taking ethanol, uh, converting it to longer chain hydrocarbons through de dehydrogenation or oligomerization. So this is kind of all indications of the, the chemical industry taking what can be produced by bio roots and converting it into higher value products. And this is a process that Lancer Tech has been working on. Uh, so the, the roots that are used here uh, is uh, where you take these non-food plant oils uh, and instead of doing the reestification that I mentioned before to produce the fames, the fames you cannot use for jets because the energy density is too low. And the reason for that is that there's too much oxygen. And oxygen weighs too much and doesn't give any energy content. So you need to have hydrocarbons where there's no oxygen. But what you do is that you take the, the, the fatty acids and you do a hydrogenation so you get uh, the, only the hydrocarbon fraction and you can blend that in. Uh, and so these are the three different routes that I mentioned uh, here, taking fatty acids, for example, from canola or other uh, dedicated uh, seeds or, or, or plants. Or, or you can go via isobutylene here, or you can have a syngas route uh, as Lanta Tech is introducing. So let me talk a little bit uh, for the rest of my talk about some of the barriers and opportunities. So first, a little bit about the, the, that it's costly to develop a cell factory. So this is, this is the major challenge we're facing. Uh, so basically, it, it seems simple. How, how can this be very difficult? We're going to take our raw material, we're going to produce our product. We could illustrate it like this. We maybe have a yeast cell here, it's mainly producing ethanol. Maybe it's producing a little bit of glycerol and some CO2. So, you know, we just kick out the, the byproducts or maybe insert a new pathway to make a new product. It, it's kind of simple when we look at it from when we on the drawing board when we draw out this pathway here. However, metabolism is immensely complex, so so that's why this is a challenge because yeast has of course evolved to love to produce ethanol, and so therefore when we want to convince it to produce something else, we are up against these millions of years of evolution, and and that's challenging. So therefore, also the most cost developing a new bioprocess is actually in developing the cell factory. So uh, you have the pretreatment, the purification and formulation are relatively standard processes, kind of plug and play, uh, but development of the, of the cell factory, the catalyst is what cost. And, and typically it's in the range of 50 million US dollars, in some cases even more. So to overcome this problem here, what is often seen is partnership as, as in the case of isobutanol, BP and DuPont uh, partnered up, Farnesane, Total, Amaris. You can see often very big companies here, actually two big companies, but also otherwise big companies partnering up with smaller biotech companies here, BSF for Genomatica, to produce one for butandiol, which is used to production of spandex. So these partnerships are made in order to de-risk, but also, of course, to bring in different competences in developing a new bioprocess. So as I said, it takes time and it's costly to go from this kind of proof of principle strain to the final strain. So we really need a lot of novel technologies in order to speed up this, bring down the cost. And this, I think, is probably the major barrier today that is too expensive and it's too complicated to develop these cell factories. So this is one of the things that we really have to focus on. How this is done uh, is uh, we are recruiting techniques from synthetic biology uh, where we hopefully in the future can develop advanced computer models to design, then we can implement and build these using synthetic biology tools, we can test them, we can learn something about the biology, we can feed that back to the design. I'm not going to really talk about this, but we are working on all aspects of this, uh, as well as many other research groups around the world, in order to allow us to process through this cycle uh, of design, build, test faster. 
So then let me talk a little bit about difficult to obtain cost competitive production. The difficulty with that is that if you, you have your sugar, the sugar is today about maybe 30 cents per kilo. And you need to convert that into a, let's say a fuel. Let's say you have a yield conversion of 50%, which is very high mass wise. Let's say you have that, that you have for bioethanol. So that means you can get, uh, you know, from the, from the, along the glucose cost, you know, you're going to spend about 60 cents to make the ethanol. Now then, of course, you have to pay for all the other things, uh, but often in these processes here, sugar cost alone accounts for about 70%. But you, you can see you're already about at, at a dollar per kilogram of bioethanol alone from these considerations here. So therefore, you are extremely sensitive to the sugar price in these calculations here. And so therefore, it's possible, we did also some calculations on production of, for example, hydrocarbons with yeast. It is possible to be profitable in this, but you have to be at a sugar price of about 10 cents per kilogram. Now, the, the problem with the sugar price is that it's very much following the oil price because one of the major costs for the farmers is actually gasoline for their tractors and so on. So uh, when the oil price goes down, the sugar price goes down, but then also it's difficult to compete. So this will never really happen unless it's mandated. Political decisions have to enter into this space and drive it out from the, out from the principle that we have to do this to redu reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There are a number of examples, though, that, that there are a lot of additional benefits. So this is actually from vitamin B2, a more value-added product, uh, production by BSF. They changed from a completely chemical route and went to a cost was reduced. I don't know who made this axis here. It's, it, it's inverted, so just to confuse all of us, I guess. Uh, but still, cost was reduced, and also the environmental burden was significantly reduced. So these are, of course, some of the, uh, the, the benefits of this. So basically, I'm not going to talk about sensitive to volatile oil prices because it's kind of obvious that it's there, but it's maybe something we can discuss further also. So let me talk a little bit about the opportunities. So pro possible to produce molecules with improved properties. This has been laid out, all the different chemicals that we can actually produce from the different feedstocks that is available. So the diversity is, is large, so we have a lot of opportunities. We can do this sustainable because we can use biomass, we can produce these products when these products are combusted, for example, eventually, we get CO2, it goes back, or if it's put into a car and burned into CO2, it again goes back to the plant, so we have a closed carbon cycle. The issue of biomass is important. Uh, what biomass can we use today? As I said, it's mainly sugarcane, corn and wheat that is used for in this industry here. But there has been much work about growing dedicated energy cane that is actually grows so fast that it can be harvested twice per year. And it has a lower sugar content than sugar cane, but you don't care so much about that because you just want to have the fast growth in order to get the biomass fraction. There's wood, uh, there's a lot of that in Sweden. Uh, that wood is valuable also as, as a material, of course, but there's a lot of branches generated that can be used uh, as, a, as a biomass feedstock for this. Uh, interesting is this issue of scale I talked about. Uh, if we look on the ethanol production uh, in the US, that is really centered here in the Midwest, as you can say, which is often referred also to as the Corn Belt. Uh, the, the reason for this is that it doesn't make sense to make two large plants, because then you need to, to transport in the, the feedstock, the corn, from too large of an area. And then you begin to lose on transportation cost uh, into the factory. So that's why you, you have compared with the chemical industry where you can pipeline the oil and you can build a very large refinery. You do have a disadvantage to some extent. Uh, so there has been a lot of interesting development though in this field about modulizing some of these plants here so they can be built cheaper. Uh, so you can build many smaller plants that are still big uh, after many standards, definitely compared with biopharmaceutical production, but uh, where you can modulize that and then uh, get still the scale of magnitude. A little bit about the greenhouse gas emission reduction. As I said, we did some uh, calculations of that. Uh, here you can see uh, the emission from, from gasoline, sugarcane ethanol, corn grain ethanol. It's a very small redu reduction, actually. And one of the major reasons for that is, uh, is actually that uh, a lot of energy is going into fertilizers required for production of the corn. 
cellulosic ethanol is good, uh, diesel, sugarcane uh, diesel, uh, biodiesel is good, and so on. Cellulosic biodiesel would actually be a real win uh, situation. Clean technology. Uh, this was an interesting uh, paper published recently in Nature, where they showed that biofuel blending reduces particle emission from aircraft engines at cruise conditions. Uh, this is actually uh, uh, visualized already here. This is uh, with a blend of 50% biojets into the into the engine compared with here. Now, uh, why care about uh, particle emission? Well, that has a huge impact on global warming as such. So, uh, so there is an added benefit. We're not only talking about greenhouse gas emission reduction, but we're also talking about particle emission. And that's actually another point I didn't mention, that we do have a lot of oil left, but this oil is getting more and more crude and containing more and more sulfur and being more and more kind of the dirty type oil that we have left. So let me end the last few minutes on the power of biology, which is of course an opportunity. So we have all kinds of different cell factories here that we can use, and these are some of them often used. Fungus, Aspergillus niger, E. coli, which is a gut bacteria, uh, Bacillus subtilis, uh, and Corinium bacterium glutamicum. So these are probably the five most dominant used cell factories. We are using mainly Saccharomyces cerevisiae because it's used so well in ethanol production and it's already used for many different types of products. It's also extremely well characterized. It's probably one of the organisms on this planet that we know the most of, actually maybe more than on the human cell, despite all the medical research. Uh, it's genetically tractable. Uh, it's what often referred to as generally regarded as safe because it's been used for production of foods for many years. It's very robust. It's already used for production of many, many different products. So we work on engineering yeast to produce many different types of products and develop technologies for kind of doing this, enabling technologies for doing this engineering here. And I'm just going to give quickly a few examples. So one example is we worked on production of this chemical here, 3-hydroxypropionic acid. There's quite some interest in this from some uh, Swedish companies who is producing acrylates, which are super absorbent materials uh, that goes into diapers, for example. But also they can be used in contact lenses, many, many other different types of materials. It's a huge market, uh, polyacrylates, uh, and uh, there are many companies that are interested in that. What we did, we took a pathway inserted that into yeast. Yeast not only don't produce this compound here, we did a number of engineering steps and then we could basically, in this iterative fashion, improve the production tenfold of this compound here. We've also worked on producing perfume molecules where we take a plant gene, insert into yeast, and then have yeast to produce this, these molecules here that are used in perfume. Why would you do that? Uh, you can extract them from plants. Well, many of these plants are rare plant species. They're difficult to get in scale. Uh, so therefore, with yeast, you can have a scalable production. Again, uh, we did a number of engineering of the endogenous metabolism of yeast in order to improve the performance of it, together with expression of this uh, sesquiterpene synthase that produced that specific perfume. And this is actually a process now that, uh, that the company that we work with, Firmenich, a Swiss company, has taken forward for commercial production of some of their uh, perfume ingredients. We can do the same thing to produce farnesine. We worked on that. This is also something that Total, a, a large French energy company, has partnered up with Amaris to, to produce. You can see that this is this branch chain hydrocarbon. It has the perfect properties for jet fuel because it has the right uh, fluid properties as well as also it doesn't freeze at the, the low temperatures in the air. Uh, so we, uh, we engineered yeast uh, to produce these, uh, these compounds here. Amaris has progressed uh, further with this and, and, and are very far on this. Uh, still, still hard to reach this, the final yields that you need to be cost competitive. But it's used in buses in Brazil where they also have their production. Uh, resveratrol uh, is an antioxidant uh, produced by plants. There's quite a lot of interest in this uh, in terms of a dietary supplement, but also for treatment of various diseases uh, that has been reported to have a positive effect. Uh, we inserted different pathways for that and engineered also the endogenous metabolism. And this is actually a product that is now also on the market, launched by Evolva, a Danish-Swiss biotech company. And you can now buy resveratrol as, as dietary supplement pills produced by yeast instead of extracted from Chinese uh, root plants. 
Ornithine spermidine, uh, this is an interesting story. Uh, we were working on production of ornithine, which is a dietary supplement also, uh, particularly by used by bodybuilders. Uh, but it, and it's a complicated amino acid to produce. Uh, but uh, recently, I, uh, you know, we heard from, from various colleagues in the field that spermidine is, a, is an even more interesting molecule to produce because it has autophagy-inducing properties. And this has been demonstrated to have this positive effect, for example, on Alzheimer's and a number of other neurodegenerative diseases. So we thought we could take our ornithine strain and engineer it further to produce spermidine, and we have done that, and we can now produce spermidine at a cost-competitive uh, price and actually begin to deliver this if it's going to be needed for, uh, for example, for treatment of Alzheimer's. And let me end just very briefly talk about production of some of the, the hydrocarbons that can be directly be blended in and used, for example, in jet fuels. So we took uh, yeast, again, did a number of engineering uh, steps of this, inserted genes from other organisms and so on, and, and generated what we call a platform, a yeast strain that can efficiently produce free fatty acids. And you can see here all, some of all the steps that was introduced. We uh, took that further uh, and we could also produce, for example, the alcohol form. Uh, we can produce significant amounts of this, uh, but we can also produce the alkanes, but these enzymes here are really working inefficiently in yeast, so this is a challenge for us right now. But as I said earlier on, if we can produce the free fatty acid, these can be dehydrogenated chemically directly to the hydrocarbons. We also worked on production of shorter chain fatty acids. There's interest in that, of course, going into gasoline. So there we worked on engineering on the fatty acid synthase. So we actually changed uh, and inserted a new module, a new enzyme module in this multi-complex enzyme. This enzyme normally produces fatty acid that has a length of 16 carbons. And now we can have this fatty acid synthase to produce uh, fatty acid that has a length of C8 or, or C10 illustrated here how that, that could work. I'll not go into details about the, the principle of that. We've also engineered yeast to go the other direction to produce very long chain fatty acids. There's interest in that from cosmetics. Uh, these are hard to get. There are very few plants that are producing fatty acid of this length here. Uh, but again, through engineering of yeast metabolism, we could then bring up and now produce in the order of 100 milligrams per liter of what is called docasinol, which is a fatty alcohol of chain length C22. And this is used uh, widely in cosmetics and other, other ingredients. So with that, let me thank all the people who did the work behind this, all the funders, uh, particularly uh, the Wallenberg Foundation, which has been very generous support of much of our research over time. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> yeah, we have time for one or two questions for Jens. I can actually start, and, and I wonder about, uh, you know, you said that yeast is a model organism for, for metabolic engineering, of course, and I wonder if there's things that you learn about yeast metabolism are they relevant at all for human metabolism as well? I mean, it feels like carbon metabolism is carbon mm -hmm. metabolism. I mean, what you learn in one organism may be useful for... Yeah, Can you comment on that? Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, so many of the things are, are yeast metabolism is a scaffold uh, and, and, and really, you know, kind of provides... Uh, concepts that we can uh, deduce over to uh, to uh, human cells, and and that's particularly for some of the very uh, w which I believe is ancient because it's been so highly conserved between yeast and man uh, is uh, for example some of the regulation of of energy metabolism. Mm -hmm. So that's highly conserved between plants, yeast, and and humans. I mean, like mitochondria. Uh, no, we're talking about the key, you know, kinases and, and that are regulating, for example, I mean, TOR or AMPK or something like that. Uh, these mm -hmm. pathways are highly conserved. So there we can learn something. But one has to be still be relatively careful. I think the biggest uh, lessons we make is in terms of methods and concepts that we yeah. can bring over. And there yeast is a wonderful organism because, you know, we can modulate it, we can, you know, grow it in all different kinds of conditions and so on. And, and then we can learn some concepts and we can then use that to, for example, analyze data that comes from the clinic. Mm. Is it naive to think uh, that, that we, we could look at populations of yeast? So yeast that are closely genetically related, similar to how humans are so mm -hmm. closely genetically related, that you could also do studies on populations of yeast in, in yeah, yeah, you, in we that can, way. We can do that. I mean, the, the, the point is just that, the, that, you know, if you have a population of yeast cells in, in, a, in a flask 
and one of them is growing a little bit better than the other ones, uh-huh. it'll take over. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we, it's we humans like are social Darwinian. nature, yeah. so we don't do that. <laughs> right, right. Okay. <laughs> so, so therefore, I don't think we learn a lot about uh, social interactions and no. so on. Uh, yeah. All right. Is there any other questions for Jens? I just want to make one comment, actually. And I was talking to John during the break about the, uh, the particulates. So you mentioned how uh, de- uh, biofuel has proven to have fewer particulates than, mm-hmm. than, than burning uh, oil. And, and that, that has health implications, uh, mm-hmm. obviously. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you mentioned it in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, mm-hmm. which, of course, also have health implications. But uh, is, is that a way to sell biofuels uh, as well? Well, I mean, um, I, I think it should basically be an easy sell. But of course, people are, you know, more caring about their health mm. and not thinking about that in, in 30 or 40 years, millions of people will die because of flooding. Mm. I mean, we're not, you know, it's, we're go- it's going to be massive in countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan, you know, that are heavily populated. And if the water rise, and, 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 you know... Uh, MIT will be flooded. Mm. I mean, there are very clear projections about that. Uh, so Boston better begin to build dikes. Uh, and, but, you know, it's a, it's a human thing also that, that we are not caring so much about what is happening, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ahead, um, even though the projections are very, very clear. Uh, we are much more caring about ourselves and, yeah. and our own health. Yeah. And so there is a complete disproportion about the catastrophe that is kind of awaiting the society down the road and the amount of investment that we are putting into this. I mean, you see some of the big private foundations are beginning to chip into this. I mean, Gates Foundation recently made a huge initiative in this area here. Yeah. Uh, but compared with how much is spent on, on health cost. Yeah, that, I think that's a very relevant yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Okay, then if there's no further questions, we should thank Jens again for an interesting presentation. I have given the honor to give you a wrap up, not only of today, but also on yesterday. Uh, And I want to spend about 25 minutes to try to summarize my thoughts about this fantastic uh, two days. So uh, I'm going to start with what Gunnar von Heine was talking about, uh, the past. And I agree very much with him. That kind of uh, systematic science started with Linnaeus uh, and biology here in Sweden. Uh, and since I'm a Swede, I also think that the 19th century, uh, you know, this was the, the century of the chemist where we got the periodic table. And Berzelius in Stockholm was actually, he and his colleague actually discovered one fourth of all the elements. So we, I'm, I guess I'm proud of that as a Swede. The 20th century. A lot of things happened, uh, internet, IT, and all of that. But when it comes to science, I think particularly the physics was really the century where we discovered all the elements and the quarks and all these guys that you can't really pronounce. Um, And then we are now, I believe, very much in the century where medicine and human biology will be systematically gone through. And you heard a lot of that during these two days, and I come back to that. Um, When it comes to life science then, I again agree very much with Gunnar von Heine. To me, sort of the modern life science started in 1953 in Cambridge with Watson and Crick. Uh, But I guess the first 30 years since then sort of was the the, the, the sort of decenniums of biochemistry and molecular biology, and it was very much driven by that. Then in 1980, something very dramatic happened, and that was the event of gene technology that drove so much of life science during these 20 years. And then, headed by Lee Hood and others, uh, in 20. 2000, uh, we became very much genomics driven. Uh, And uh, I guess this is mainly in the academia or in academics. 
On the applied side, something completely different happened, which is a little bit more of a silent revolution, and that is the move from chemistry to biology in drugs, and I come back to that. And I agree very much with several of the speakers during these two days. We are now moving into a completely new era, a very exciting era in life science, and that is the systems biology-driven era, uh, which is very much cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary. And and I will come back about that. So we are, I think, and you, you know, you can always say that, but we are, and someone said it yesterday, that we are in a transformational point in time. We are mapping all the building blocks of life, not only in humans, but also in other species. I think we can get a more holistic view of human biology than this, and hopefully that will then be translated into how we treat people. Uh, as Leroy Hood was saying, we are in the area of deciphering the complexity of life, and we are actually just scratching on the surface. And that is why it's so exciting to be living right now. Uh, and again, a quote from Leroy Hood, uh, genome gives you the potential, it doesn't give you your destiny. I think that's very well put, and that's why I'm very much interested in moving beyond genomics for the future. I just wanted to point out we had a very interesting philosophy or ethical discussions yesterday about aging. I find it absolutely amazing that the fundamentals of aging is yet not understood, uh, which I think is incredibly interesting. Uh, and again, on cancer, I think I just want to mention that we're still doing very crude treatments. Uh, and this is, of course, very important for many of us. Half of the men in this room will be di diagnosed with cancer and one third. So that is, of course, uh, very, very important. And then I already mentioned this other sort of paradigm shift that has happened. So uh, what is then the nature of life science research, as you have heard during these days? I think uh, Anna Videl said it very nicely. It's nice that a medical person says that it is not an engineer like me, that success in biology medicine is technology driven. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and therefore, you need collaborations between medical, technical, and biological science. And I think we heard a beautiful example from KI and that's not the uh, KI in Stockholm, but in Boston. But I also think that uh, SciLife Lab is really very much similar vision and mission as the Koch Institute. We heard several times these interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. For me, it's a very big difference between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And I'm a big believer in multidisciplinary, uh, where you actually combine expertise from difference, and in this way, you create knowledge and, and applications. Interdisciplinary is interesting, but to me, that is trying to be beyond between different disciplines. And that's interesting. But this is where the future is, I think. Uh, and then I also want to say that for a nation like Sweden, I think it's very important to get a balance between basic, applied and strategic research. Uh, you need all three in order to prosper in a complex uh, science and technology as, as life science. And the balance between them could of course be discussed on the political level, but I think it's almost uh, ludicrous to actually talk about that basic science is better than applied science or strategic research. We need all three of them. A little bit about Science for Life, since we, uh, we have sort of heard it a little bit. This is one of the three major Swedish governmental infrastructures, along with the two physics ones, ESS and Max 4. We're very happy that the government has decided to fund this for another four years. Uh, the idea here, and I think it's very similar to what you heard about from the Koch Institute, uh, the need for major infrastructures, technology is evolving rapidly, we're generating a lot of big data, and we therefore we want to have uh, an infrastructure that can accommodate that. And it's nice to see only in Stockholm now with these two big houses here, we have 800 people and 200 of them are only working with bioinformatics and big data. So that kind of shows you how we are, have been able in a very short time to put into two buildings these kind of expertise. 
piece. But also it's nice to see that using this kind of national infrastructure, we're able to support uh, very expensive equipment that is very hard for, for, for universities individually to support. I also want to brag a little bit. It's kind of nice to see the sort of uh, things that we have sequenced at uh, SciLife Lab, but almost half of the capacity has actually gone into uh, medical applications. And I'm particularly proud of Anna Videl and her uh, center. I think it's almost a pioneering kind of, of effort where clinic has been, been combined with uh, infrastructure uh, research. We had a long session yesterday about funding and geographical comparisons. And it was interesting to compare the different regions. We have a presentation about the United States. And it's a, in, very interesting for me, I didn't know that, that the funding has gone from 2% of gross national product down to 076 in a relatively recent times. Also, what I find <coughs> very interesting is when it comes to federal funding to academic research, it has actually gone down from 73% to 53% in a very short time, only 10 years. And philanthropy is now going up very, very much and is now up to 32% of the funding according to what we heard uh, yesterday. So that is relatively dramatic in Asia. There is, of course, also a very dramatic increase in funding in some of the countries, uh, particularly in China. But it was also interesting to see that we don't have a flood of pharma companies going into Asia to support research and, and to, uh, to do research. Uh, and I found that rather interesting. In Europe, we have, of course, a very ambitious agreement, the Lisbon Agreement, that says that we should really support research and so on. Despite that, almost all countries in Europe are decreasing their funding, which is kind of sad, I think. Uh, I think we have a flagship that we should be very careful with and we should support our politicians to keep the ERC as it is, the European Research Council. Uh, it's a success story, I think, in Europe. And it is actually based on excellence, not on geographical kind of, uh, of distribution. And I think it's very nice. And of course, it's very dramatic now that actually UK is leaving Brexit and this way it will change uh, the ERC also. Also, and this is also true from the United States, that we're seeing very important contributions from philanthropy also in countries like England, the Wellcome Trust, Denmark, the Novo Novo Foundation, and Sweden, where we have, of course, Knut and Alice Wallenberg, Alan Persson, Axel Jonsson Foundation, and so on. This is very in contrast to other countries, big countries in Europe, like France, Spain, Italy, and Germany, where you have very little philanthropy going into science. And I, actually, this is actually changing the landscape in Europe, in my mind. We didn't really talk about it yesterday, but I think it is interesting to see that United States and part of Northern Europe is very much driven by philanthropy uh, as then on top of the basic funding from government. In Sweden, I think we should be very thankful to the politicians that are very positive to science, technology and innovation. The funding has actually increased, so don't complain. That was the message from, from, from Jöran Sandberg. Uh, but he also pointed to the infrastructure chaos, which is now uh, sort of coming from all the investment that has to be done in MAX4 and, uh, and ESS, which is actually driving infrastructure funding away from life science, uh, where we now are seeing a very much, I think, in the future, shortage of funding. So he was pointing very much to uh, that the universities has to have this very high up on the agenda. I also think it's interesting from my own perspective to see this dramatic change in priority for technology-driven research. Uh, as I, we have sort of heard on this, on this uh, is the, that all, the science is driven by technology, but yet when you go to VR and even Vinova, you are seeing actually priority committees that says, we, can, we have to fund research based on medicine or biology, but it cannot be technology-driven. 
And it's almost impossible to get funding in life science now with a technology-driven uh, uh, question. And I think that's very much different from the old TFR, the Technical Research Council. So this is very dramatic, I think. I don't know if you agree. Um, a part, uh, there was also discussion what's happening in the world. And I, I just took the statistic from our own protein atlas here to show the um, 200,000 visitors that we have to the database every month. And we're very proud about this figure. Also proud that it's from more than 200 countries. You can see how dom <coughs> dominate the United States is. Almost uh, one third of the visitors every day is coming uh, from the United States. And we estimate that we have hundreds of visitors every, at every time now from the United States in the database. China used to be number 10. In a very short time, it has now moved to second, and it is increasing. So uh, it, it still has a long way to go to the United States, but it has passed United Kingdom, Germany, and Japan, and so on. So I think that's very, very interesting and maybe not surprising. Then a little bit, just I want to throw in some Swedish bragging. Um, it is nice to see that we're very good at innovations. We are second in the world, uh, according to this uh, from OECD last year, and when it comes to an index. And of course, you only choose the indexes that shows that you're kind of good. So, but, so that's what I have done here. It's also quite interesting, if you look at the Stockholm Uppsala region, 3% of the population is actually has a PhD, which is higher than both San Diego and Boston, which is the highest in the United States. So we do have also a lot of educated people. This also has led to a lot of investments. And right now, we have quadrupled the investments in startups during the last two years. And a lot of this, well, some of it is going into health and wellness. Actually, it's interesting that it says health and wellness, not biotech here. And finally, also, I'm very surprised by the fact that also Sweden is sailing up as a manufacturing in life science. And only in the last two years, we've had three very major uh, investments in manufacturing, Okta Pharma, G Health and AstraZeneca in the Stockholm Uppsala region. You heard a fantastic talk, I think, from Melvin Samson. We might have a problem with the building, but my good, we are also transforming healthcare. Patient first is, of course, uh, a cliche in a way, uh, but I do think that what we heard this morning uh, with the patients are empowered, and I really believe in this. The access to medical records, the apps that are coming, the health apps that you also heard from Lero Hood, the web-based initiatives with Cree and so on. My wife actually is a doctor at Cree, so she sits in my office and, and have patients uh, through the internet, which is quite a... Amazing, actually. Melvin also talked about the healthcare delivery models, and I think it's very important what he said about variation in outcome and actually measuring that in order to learn from the good ones and actually teach the ones that are not do, doing well. And I think that's also something coming out of the Boston Consulting Group, which I think is very, very good. I think that we need to restructure the uh, medical health system and certainly Karolinska is trying very hard. I like the patient digital scorecards, but the proof is in the pudding, as we all know. Uh, but I, I do think that the matrix with themes and functions sounds very, very, very good. And then Melvin also talked about big data and artificial intelligence, and you don't have to guess that I'm a very big fan of this. I think it's almost fantastic what's happening. It sometimes quote this is, I, I always say this it's a little bit arrogant because it's my own uh, quote, uh, but when it comes to big data, it's easier to generate the data than to get knowledge of it. And I think it's, it's also so that when we're getting the knowledge, we also have to move down and get clinical applications. But I'm absolutely convinced that what Lee is doing, what we are doing at SciLife Lab, what Anna is doing and so on, is actually, well, Anna is already down here, but all of us, uh, we will also move down where Anna is. I also want to say that when it comes to big data, 
I think it's incredible also how philanthropy and companies are moving into this. The Microsoft people just funded 500 million in Seattle for the Cell Atlas Institute and the Allen Brain Atlas. Uh, Facebook of all people, uh, moved in actually with 2.6 billion US dollars, but only with 600 million to create a, a cell atlas. And then uh, Google just announced a, a couple of weeks ago about the product Baseline, which is kind of a precision medicine kind of initiative. And then IBM is now working very heavily with Watson Health in order to take the Watson into the health arena. So this is happening and we have to be there. And I think that Sweden has a very good opportunity to actually not only compete, but actually do better than some of these initiatives. So um, I also want to just say a little bit about this. This is again Boston Consulting Group. It's a fantastically depressing slide. It shows the new medical entities coming out of pharma industry per billion dollar R&D spend in pharma from the 50s all the way to 2010. And what you can see, this is a logarithmic scale inflation adjusted. You can see that they are producing less and less and less, but they are more and more commercially viable, which is kind of amazing. It's, it's kind of a business story by itself. This is now changing. You can kind of see it's going up here, but after 2010, it has dramatically started to increase. And the reason for this is that we have realized that we can go from chemical drugs to biological drugs, which are much, much more precision to these. And actually in 2016, these are estimates, six out of the 10 largest drugs in the world are proteins, most of them antibodies, and more or less all the big pharma companies now, 50% of the pipeline are biologicals. So this is very, very dramatic since it was less than 1% only t uh, 20 years ago. And this is why we are very proud to be mapping all the human proteins because obviously the proteins are the targets for pharma in the future. And then finally, no, not finally, second to final, I want to say a little bit about uh, Leroy Hood's talk. I agree with everything he's saying. I think uh, that we now have a possibility to decipher bi biological complexity. What Lee has done during since 1970 is amazing. And it's amazing to see that he's still delivering innovations and is leading the field in the way he's doing. Uh, precision medicine is, of course, the vision to have the right treatment to the right patients, but also to have better diagnostic methods to probe health and disease. And who is better to talk about that than Leroy Hood? So uh, this is the number of papers, publications in precision medicine, personalized health. And you can see since 1990 uh, how this is now changing and we have a flood of papers coming on. So this is actually right now happening like crazy. Obviously, this is big data and, and trying to then comprehensively monitoring health just as was outlined today. And I think this hopefully will lead us to a better health providers and, and so on. I want to give a little bit pitch also for our own, uh, very much inspired by Leroy Hood's efforts. We call it the S3 wellness program, program which is a collaboration between the Biobank effort, Scopis, and the SciLife Lab, where we are basically combining medical imaging with classical diagnostics and then throwing almost all the omics that we have at SciLife on 100 uh, individuals that we're following for two years. And we have now coming one and a half year into this and we produced 0.5 petabyte of data and now we're just overwhelmed and we have no knowledge but hopefully we will have that by December. So for me precision medicine is important in four ways. First of all uh, as was pointed out I think yesterday early detection of disease is important especially in cancer and if we can actually detect uh, cancers and other diseases earlier this would be very beneficial without actually having any new drugs and it will also save society a lot of money. 
The other part which we're all hoping for and what the pharma companies are hoping very much for is companion diagnostics. That is really to choose the patient and choose it individualized treatment. And this is what was outlined by Lee. Also interesting that we kind of have already is the follow-up on treatment. So you can actually following how your treatment is, is, is su succeeding and how efficient it is. I think this is also very important. And then finally, the wellness profiling that has been pioneered by, by Lee, uh, I think is also very interesting uh, in the combination with apps and so on. Finally, I want to say a little bit about environmental applications, what Jens was talking about. I think it's important to point out that life science is really here to address some of the global challenges that we have in the world, such as the carbon footprint, the energy demand, food supply. And I think that uh, Jens very elegantly actually told us that the solution, it is cell factories and to use cells to produce the uh, products for tomorrow. I want to pitch, since we have had Paul Hudson, one of the SciLife Lab fellows uh, as our chairman, I want to say a little bit about what he's doing, and he doesn't know that I'm gonna do that, uh, but, but just to give you a perspective of how important it is to try to tame the, 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 uh, the nature and use it for our own benefit. If you look at the sun, it is the source of basically all energy we're using today. Oil, gas, carbon, uh, wood, water plants, windmills, solar panels, all of this really is the sun that has given us indirectly the energy today. The only one really which is not uh, based on the sun is nuclear power, and that is sort of going out. So how can we then use the sun? This is how much energy do we need? So I think this is actually, Paul has done this calculation that if you look at the this total energy demand in Sweden, it's about 365 terawatts watt per year. This corresponds to the sunlight that is hitting this little thing at Gotland every year. So if we can get the energy from the sun and convert it, we need to have two times two mil or 20 times 20 kilometers. So you can actually see this is the real potential. And it's interesting to see the production of electricity from solar panels, which is all basically the physics and material science. This is going down, the manufacturing cost. And you can sort of calculate that by 2030, they should be down where the oil price is today. So hopefully the physics can then make the oil too expensive to use. But maybe we're not there. But another way of doing it is to, instead of using physics, to use life science. And this is then what, uh, what Jens was talking about, programming cell factories to do things. And I just want to say that Paul Hudson and his group have been working on using uh, cyanobacteria, photosynthetic bacteria, to produce fuel. And this is what, what is happening now. And the objective here is to be able to do 5% conversion all the energy coming into the photosynthetic bacteria to produce fuel. And in this way, we would have no energy problems in the world. We would save the planet. So that's our humble goal at KTH. So just as uh, I kind of stole this from, from Jens Nilsson, uh, there are three generations of biofuels. The ethanol from sugar, which is not really that good, ethanol from cellulose, which is kind of emerging, but then maybe we can think about designer fuels that are actually produced in, in solar panels. So the advantage of these designer fuels is that you will have no carbon input, only use sun, water and air, generate fuel during the sunny parts of the year, use the infrastructures that are already there and so on. So my last slide is just then to say a little bit about the political challenges in science that we talked about yesterday. It's very interesting to see the battle now between evidence-based policy 
and policy-based evidence has sort of been remarkably successful in parts of the world actually now. And of course, it's a challenge for us as scientists where we so much believe in evidence to base our policy, but actually where the public is very much wants to use policy to actually produce evidence. Uh, and this is of course true about global warming and GMO that we talked about yesterday. Finally, I just want to, before I end, I just want to thank very much Peter M. Lund and Stefan Nord Lund, it should be, at the Axel Jonsson Foundation and the Stockholm Science City Foundation for organizing these two days. I think it's a lovely setting, fantastic uh, speakers, and, and basically very nice. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.